Seeing is believing. Dramatic Evidence of a Creator God by George E. Vanderman, 1989. Chapter 3. Who Told the Honeybee? Computers and rockets and dictionaries and planes are the product of genius and hard work, but the men who design them are the product of accident and chance, or so we are told. But did you know that the common honeybee, without even trying, can upset the conclusions of brilliant minds? Just how much are you willing to attribute to the unlikely magic of the ages? If evolution happened, how did it happen? Would it be unreasonable to ask some specific questions in one small area? Come with me as we watch the fascinating activities of the common honeybee. I promise there will be some surprises and a rather formidable dilemma for those who credit all creation to the supposed power of time to do in the past what it cannot do now. Have you ever noticed that bees are incredible architects? The hive is a masterpiece of engineering with rows and rows of six-sided rooms with walls of wax. The marble palace that we call a comb is built by young bees under 17 days old. Yet each little room is the same size, six-sided, with each of three pairs of walls facing the other. The walls of the rooms are only one 350th of an inch thick, yet so strong that one pound of comb will support at least 25 pounds of honey. How do these young bees know that the hexagon has the smallest circumference, therefore requiring the smallest amount of building material? How do they know that hexagon cells are the best and most economical plan? Who told them? <laughs> Yet they do it all without blueprints or drawing boards or protractors. And every cell is perfect, just the size to fit a bee. How do they do it? They hang themselves up like a festoon from the roof of the hive. Or it may be in the hollow of a tree. One bee hooks onto the roof and another bee hooks onto his dangling legs and so on. These chains of bees grow longer and longer and as they sway back and forth, they hook onto bees on the right and left until they form a living curtain. They hang themselves up like this to produce wax. You see, there are four wax pockets on each side of the bee's abdomen. And after about 24 hours of hanging, wax begins to appear from these pockets. When a bee feels its wax is ready, it climbs up over the other bees, takes the wax out of its pockets, chews it, and pats it onto the comb. At first, they just pile on wax. Then they form rough cups climb into them and push. And apparently, all this pushing sets of vibrations which enable the bees to judge the elasticity and thickness of the walls. The result, the perfect shape and the incredibly thin walls. And that's the way the comb is built. The bees perform their tasks in perfect cooperation as if their assignments were posted on a bulletin board. It must be a marvel of organization, you say. Yes, but who directs it? It is true that no honeybee lives to itself. They all live for the hive. There may be 40 to 75,000 bees in a hive or more, all working in perfect harmony as a unit. But who is the leader? Is it the queen? You might say she exerts leadership at the time of swarming. But even then, the worker bees play the key role in locating a new nest site. The queen, of course, is an egg-laying machine. In a single day, she can lay 2,000 eggs. And evidently, she does produce chemical signals that in some way enable the colony to function smoothly. For we are told that it takes less than 100 worker bees to build a comb if the queen is present, but thousands of them if there is no queen. But is she the leader of the hive? Certainly not. And the drones are not the leaders. These male bees are completely indolent. 
They spend their lifetime waiting, just waiting for a chance to chase after a queen on her mating flight. The worker bees are unquestionably the real marvels of the hive, but they have no leader. Yet somehow they get all the right things done. Bees need two things, pollen and nectar. Both are found in flowers. And as they fly off to the fields of flowers, they go marvelously equipped. In the first place, a honeybee is fantastically engineered flying machine. Man-made freight planes can carry a payload of about 25% of their weight, but bees can carry almost 100% of their weight. The bee needs no propeller or jet. Its short, wide wings both lift and drive it. It can move straight up or down, or it can hover in midair. Its stubby wings fold in a split second when it dives into a flower, or it can use its wings as a fan to cool the beehive. The bee has three places for storing cargo. One is a tank inside its body in which it stores nectar. Then on its hind legs, it has two storage baskets for carrying pollen. Imagine a freight plane with its load dangling underneath. Are these pollen baskets something that evolved because of a need? Well, man first wrote about the bee in the year 3000 BC. It had the pollen baskets then, and it hasn't changed since. A bee can suck up a load of nectar in one minute. It takes three minutes for it to build up two bulging loads of pollen in the baskets on its hind legs. How does it do it? Well, the bee dives into a flower, its body picking up pollen by brushing past the pollen boxes. It splashes about in the flower and the yellow powder clings to the hairs on its body. But now it isn't so simple. How does it get the pollen into the baskets? And how does it keep the pollen from blowing away in flight? The load must be moistened, pressed together, tamped down, and evenly balanced on each leg. But believe it or not, the bee does it and all the while hovering in midair or hanging by one claw. And now the little honeybee acting as a scout has discovered a field of flowers and is ready to return to the hive with a sample of nectar and the pollen. How will it find its way back? Keep in mind that it may be several miles away and that its search may have led it in several directions before it made its discovery. Yet now it will fly straight back to the hive. Who told it how to do it? What sort of navigational equipment does it possess? And once back in the hive, how will it communicate to its thousands of fellow bees the location of the treasure it has found? It is true that bees are able to distinguish odors with great skill. If a bee returns to the hive with nectar from flowers nearby, the other bees will leave the hive and fly directly to the source. And they also act as if they have an internal clock. If they discover that food is available at a particular time of day, they return for more at the same hour the next day. But what if the flowers are several miles distant? Surely there must be some limitation to the tiny creature's sense of smell. What then? How can the little bee get across to its fellow bees the location of the treasure it has found? Well, you haven't heard anything yet. Let me tell you about the waggle dance. Sometimes a bee, returning with nectar and pollen, goes through a peculiar performance that many scientists believe is its way of communicating the location of the source of nectar. It gives samples of the nectar to the other bees and gets them all excited. Then, as they watch, it does a fancy dance before them called the waggle dance because of the way it waggles its abdomen. It goes through a figure eight across the face of the comb. And the astonishing thing is that the angle of the dance down the vertical comb represents the horizontal direction of the food source with respect to the direction of the sun. And not only that, the number of dances per minute 
indicates the distance to the field. But surprisingly, the number is in reverse ratio to the distance. That is, the farther away the field, the smaller the number. In other words, if the bee goes through 10 rounds in 15 seconds, the field of flowers is 300 feet away. But if the bee moves in slow motion, say two rounds in 15 seconds, the flowers are almost four miles away. And listen to this, a little calculation will show that this relationship to distance is not one of simple arithmetic, but is logarithmic. What do you think of that? What kind of brain does the little honeybee have? Who taught it to do all this? How did this tiny creature learn to relate sun angles and distances to dance step routines? And how is it that millions of bees understand the language? Now, I am aware that some scientists are not convinced that bees do understand the language. They are not convinced that this strange dance really does communicate to other bees the location of a field of flowers. I am aware of the controversy over this matter. But if by any chance you are inclined to doubt, then consider this, a bee, by means of this dance, can communicate the location to human beings. Men can understand it. Men can watch the dance and find the field of flowers. Is that any less striking? Is it any less a miracle to communicate that information to human beings in logarithmic terms than to get it across to other bees? I think not. I say again, what kind of brain must the little honeybee have? Is it an accident? One writer suggests that if you wished to duplicate the internal circuitry of the honeybee, if you wished to match its navigational and guidance system, this is what you would need to start with. Internal clock, polarized light sensor, sun angle azimuth computer, instrument for measuring true vertical, dead reckoning equipment, wind speed and direction indicator, trigonomic calculator and tables, air and ground speed indicators. <coughs> it sounds a little extravagant, but is it really after what we have already seen of the honeybee's accomplishments? I wonder if you realize just how necessary the honeybee is, even to life itself. Bees, of course, could not exist without plants and flowers, with their pollen and their nectar. But it works both ways. Many kinds of plants and flowers could not exist without the bees to pollinate them. In fact, many of the most beautiful or most fruitful plants would disappear, and what a loss that would be. Now tell me, let's reason again. Did the honeybee, with all its fantastic equipment for its job, just happen through long ages, a little bit at a time? What if the bee started out with no pollen baskets on its hind legs? What if it had the pollen baskets but not the knee joints to press the pollen into the baskets or the sense to know how to do it? What if it had no hairs on its body to collect the pollen? Or the hairs, but no way to comb off the pollen? What if it hadn't developed a nectar tank yet? What if it had no wax making equipment or didn't know it was supposed to hang up in a festoon for 24 hours to make the wax come out? What if the wax would not withstand the high temperatures of the hive, as few waxes could? What if the bees didn't know how to make royal jelly to feed the queen and the queen died? What if a bee couldn't find its way back to the hive or back to a field of flowers? The questions fairly tumble out. They are endless. 
I think you can see that any one piece of the bee's physical equipment might be useless without the others. To be of use, the bee's equipment and know-how would have to be developed simultaneously, not little by little. Or, if evolution happened, consider this. That very first bee, away back there, sitting on a limb of a tree, what kind of bee was it? Was it a queen? But a queen could not reproduce without a drone with which to mate. Was it a drone? Drones can't reproduce themselves without a queen. A worker bee then? Hardly, for worker bees are creatures that can't possibly reproduce themselves. It is difficult to escape the conclusion that the whole colony would have to evolve at once, simultaneously with every individual bee's physical equipment and know-how fully developed, ready for business. And of course, with the honeybee as with the birds, that isn't evolution at all, it is creation. Isn't it easier to believe the simple, uncomplicated, straightforward statement that you find on the first page of your Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You may have heard the story of the unbeliever who rescued an orphan boy from a burning building. Having lost his own wife and child, he wanted to adopt the lad. Christian neighbors were skeptical about the wisdom of placing the boy in an infidel home. But the applicant won his case when he held up his hand badly burned in the rescue of the lad and said, I have only one argument. It is this. He proved to be a good father, and little Jimmy never tired of hearing how daddy had saved him from the fire. And he liked best to hear about the scarred hand. One day with his new father, he visited a display of art masterpieces. One painting interested him especially, the one of Jesus reproving Thomas for his unbelief and holding out his scarred hand. Tell me the story of that picture, Daddy, the little fellow pleaded. No, not that one. Why not? Because I don't believe it. But you tell me the story of Jack the giant killer and you don't believe that. So he told him the story, and Jimmy said, It's like you and me, Daddy. And then he went on. It wasn't nice of Thomas not to believe after the good man had died for him. What if they had told me how you saved me from the fire, and I had said, I didn't believe you did it? The father could not escape the sound reasoning of a little child. He had used his own scarred hand to win a small boy's heart. Could he continue to resist the scarred hand of the man who had died for him and say he didn't do it? The mightiest argument of all is the cross of Calvary, the scarred hands of Jesus, hands that were wounded in his encounter with the forces of evil so that you and I could live. What can we do but fall at his feet and say with Thomas, my Lord and my God?